Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Jordanian television broadcasts the confession of the wife of one of the Amman attackers. According to her confession, she accompanied her husband to carry out the attacks, but she was not able to explode herself. Sajida Mubarak Atras, born in 1970, an Iraqi national living in Ramadi. On November 5th, I accompanied my husband to Jordan with forged Iraqi passport under the name of Ali Hussein Ali and Sajida Abdul Qadir Latif. We waited and a white car arrived with a driver and a passenger. We rode with them and entered Jordan from Iraq. My husband arranged our trip from there. I don't know. In Jordan, we rented an apartment. He had two explosive belts. He put one on me and wore the other. He taught me how to use it, how to pull the cord and operate it. He said it was to carry out attacks on hotels in Jordan. We rented a car and entered the hotel on November 9th. My husband and I went inside the hotel. He went to one corner and I went to another. He went to one corner and I went to another. There was a wedding at the hotel with children, women, and men inside. My husband detonated his bomb. I tried to explode mine, but it wouldn't. I left. People fled running and I left running with them. <laughs> We are talking once again about Jordan. It is facing major challenges in the aftermath of the suicide attacks that rocked its capital and thus defacing the kingdom's reputation of being the safe oasis of the Middle East. In the wake of these explosions, politicians fear that the kingdom will turn its back on political reforms, which were initiated and launched after Jordan's King Abdullah started his reign six years ago. الأردن على المحك والتفجيرات التي اكتوت المملكة بنارها أكدت حقيقة أن لا أحد After the explosions in Jordan, Amman was put under the microscope and these attacks showed that nobody is safe from terrorism. The unique and special location of Jordan makes it difficult for Amman to maintain a balanced relationship with the outside world. It is worth mentioning that Jordan is a country that separates Israel from the rest of the Arab world. Due to its location, Jordan was destined to deal with hostility, instability, dictatorship, and tyranny. It appears as if the explosions were a settlement of an old feud between the Kingdom of Jordan and the Abu Musab al-Zarqawi group. These latest incidents confirmed Al-Qaeda's intention of widening its operations and attacks beyond the geographic border of one country. Al-Qaeda targeted Amman to punish the Jordanian regime, as was the case of many Arab countries, for its political stance, especially of backing the United States on the so-called war on terrorism. Jordan is one of the most important United States allies in the Middle East. Its economy depends in large part on American financial support and grants. However, many Jordanians have agreed with their government's position on supporting the Iraqi war and its slow process in implementing political reforms. In addition, Jordan entered into a peace treaty with Israel, which angered the Al-Qaeda organization. On its internet website, the group vowed to inflict harm on Jordan for establishing relations with Israel. والواضح أيضا أن علاقات عمان بإسرائيل التي ترتبط معها باتفاقية سلام سبب الأخر. الأخر. 
under scrutiny. Jordanians fear that their country will back off from continuing its path on political reforms as promised by King Abdullah II after taking office due to the need to enhance national security. The Jordanian authority is expected to strengthen its policies on national security. However, liberals and independent politicians are urging the government to let campaigns of democracy and freedom take effect and not back off from political reforms for reasons of national security. In the aftermath of these explosions, Jordan went through a terrible crisis. However, it is expected to recover, and these attacks will not affect the king's initiative of implementing political reform and modernization, but he is expected to proceed with great caution. Al-Qaeda, which claimed responsibility for the attacks in Jordan, is considered a terrorist organization that has brought disasters all over the world. The following report provides us with a brief history on this organization. The extremist ideology of Al-Qaeda, led by Osama bin Laden, has brought disasters in the Islamic world because of what was committed at the hands of this extremist organization that does not serve the nation in any way. This organization is now at the top of the list of terrorist organizations that should be eliminated in countries throughout the world. Al-Qaeda's ideology was developed during the end of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan in 1988, when bin Laden established what was known as the Al-Qaeda file, which was a base where documents and comprehensive information concerning the whereabouts of Arab Mujahideen were kept. At the time it was agreed that the base keeping this information would be called Al-Qaeda. Since then, bin Laden managed to form many alliances with Islamic organizations that can be categorized as extremist, thereby influencing him towards extremism. In addition, he had personal relations with Ayman al-Zawahiri, who fled his country at the time, escaping a death sentence. The result of all this was an extremist terrorist organization with an unreasonable religious agenda, giving itself the right to kill civilians in the name of Islam, though in reality it has nothing to do with Islam. Those who are closely watching international terrorism talk about four different branches of Al-Qaeda in the world. Each uses a different style from the other, though their point of reference is the destructive ideologies of bin Laden. Geographically, these branches can be divided in the following manner. The first branch in Eastern Asia, especially Afghanistan, which until the U.S. launched war on the Taliban in 2001, was the primary base of Al-Qaeda and other organizations both ideologically and logistically. Secondly, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, whose founders came from Afghanistan following the United States war in Iraq. This group united with the Tawhid and Jihad groups led by Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, thus compelling bin Laden to recognize al-Zarqawi in 2004 as the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Later, the organization became known as Al-Qaeda in the land of the two rivers. Thirdly, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which was established beginning with the Cobra attacks in 1995 and is now now led by Saleh Alfi. Fourth, Al-Qaeda in Europe, whose leader is still unknown, but reportedly has put pressure on European governments and provoked international opinion against them in order to pressure them to withdraw their forces from Iraq. This terrorist organization is now pursued by all countries in the world. Definitely, justice will reach every cowardly criminal belonging to Al-Qaeda, which transgressed all humanitarian and moral values, transforming religion into a license to kill and shed blood. What is needed is an international strategy utilizing economic, legislative, and even military intelligence capabilities to counter terrorism in all its forms and to stop it from spreading further.
You've met with His Majesty the King. What was the focus of the talks? I talked with His Majesty first, of course, to offer the condolences of uh, the President and of the American people. Uh, we also uh, talked about uh, the response of the people here and uh, all that has been done. Uh, we talked about our common struggle against uh, terrorism and redoubling our efforts, uh, both in terms of uh, helping with security, but also redoubling our efforts to uh, to drive terrorists from uh, the, the safe havens that they have. We, we talked some also about uh, the Middle East. He, the, His Majesty knows that I was just in Israel, and he was interested in uh, the discussions I've had uh, about the peace process as well. Uh, do you think these latest attacks in Amman will affect the Jordanian-U.S. relations? I believe that uh, the Jordanian people are showing uh, what the American people showed, which is that they know that the, the issue here is the terrorist. We have to be united against the terrorist. Uh, this is no time for division among those of us who stand on the side uh, that says that we want peace and security and a more prosperous and, uh, and a democratic future. We are united and we are united against the terrorist and so I think uh, this is a, another uh, another way to show that the United States and Jordan are uh, the best of friends and will continue to be. Um, in light of um, uh, these attacks, uh, does the United States still have full confidence in Jordan and, uh, and its uh, historical reputation of being uh, an oasis of uh, stability in a rough uh, region? Well, we of course have confidence in Jordan. Uh, we have to remember that uh, it's very hard to defend against terrorist attacks of this kind. We, of course, experienced uh, devastating terrorist attacks on September 11th. Great Britain has experienced terrorist attacks. Uh, Spain, and you can add country after country, because we all take very great security measures, and, and Jordan has a very well-deserved reputation for excellent security and excellent security forces. But the terrorists only have to be right once. We have to be right 100% of the time. And that's why we have to fight uh, the war on terrorism, not just as a defensive war, but also uh, on the offense. Um, finally, Secretary Rice, terrorism has hit home dearly. And uh, Jordan has paid a price for being uh, a key US uh, ally. Um, how can the United States help Jordan um, overcome any future threats in the kingdom? Well, I think that Jordan is paying a price for being a peace-loving country uh, that the, the terrorists have targeted, much as they've targeted other peace-loving countries. And the list is long. And uh, it's a list that has a variety of relationships with the United States. Uh, I think that we, we, as Prime Minister Blair said, there is no excuse for the terrorists. They would like us to say, well, it's because of uh, the relationship with the United States or it's because of the politics of the Middle East. No, there is no justification for what they did. And so what we must do is to redouble our efforts uh, as we will to uh, try and make ourselves more secure, to continue the excellent uh, intelligence and law enforcement cooperation that we have. Uh, we have offered um, help in the investigation here. And of course, we will be ready to listen to uh, any ideas that Jordan might have about how we can help. But ultimately, we have to remain united in our struggle against these terrorists. We have to remember that there is only one choice and that is to defeat these terrorists. Uh, we cannot make excuses for them. We cannot uh, negotiate with them. We simply have to defeat terrorism. Once again, uh, Secretary Rice, thank you very much for joining us. Thank Today marked the official date of the 10th anniversary commemorating the assassination of former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. There have been a series of state remembrance events attended by Israeli and foreign dignitaries. Official ceremonies are held each year to remember the former IDF Chief of Staff and Nobel Peace Laureate on the anniversary of his murder, according to the Hebrew calendar. The main event today was a ceremony by Rabin's grave site on Mount Herzl. The Rabin family was joined at the site by President Moshe Katsav, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, and a host of dignitaries from abroad, including former U.S. President Bill Clinton and his wife, U.S. Senator Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, and EU Foreign Policy Chief Javier Solana. 
The event required heavy security, resulting in major traffic congestion in Jerusalem. At this hour, a special session in Rabin's memory is just getting underway in the Knesset. Knesset Speaker Reuven Rivlin is expected to deliver a controversial address at the gathering. According to an advanced copy of the speech, Rivlin will attack Rabin commemorations as being a crusade in which the Israeli right is blamed for the murder. Rivlin will declare that there are systematic attempts to place responsibility for the assassination on those who refuse to accept the Oslo peace process. According to Rivlin, Rabin was murdered because of his political path and not because of his career in the IDF or his role as defense minister. The murder must be condemned, said Rivlin, but circumstances of his death should not be blurred with his political stance. Joining us now in the studio to discuss the Rabin legacy is a longtime associate and friend of the slain Prime Minister Uri Dromi from the Israel Democracy Institute. Uri, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you. Is the political process that Rabin set in motion still alive today? Definitely. I think uh, Rabin opened uh, the gate and uh, it, of course it took us uh, some time. Of course he was assassinated so he couldn't uh, pursue it himself. But we had a changes of government but if you look uh, just recently Prime Minister Ariel Sharon of all people uh, disengaging from Gaza and this talk is about coming back to the roadmap it's the same. I mean, Rabin opened the way, uh, other people uh, have to follow. Negotiating with the Palestinians, that would be one of Rabin's legacies? Definitely. I, I remember flying with Rabin to uh, Washington in September 93 when he was about to meet Arafat. You know, usually on this long flight, he would sleep like a baby. This was the only time I saw him, he couldn't sleep. He turned back and forth and he got up, he had something to drink tried to sleep again. He was very anxious. He didn't like it. But he was an honest man. And he looked reality in the eyes and said, if this is the, the, the representative of the Palestinians, I'm going to try and make peace with him. So this is the legacy of Rabin. You uh, look at the reality and try uh, without any messianic uh, views to deal with it. As you just said, you're quite close with the slain Prime Minister. How would he rate the current relationship between Israel and the Palestinians right now? I think he would, uh, he would, uh, um, as always, weigh the pros and cons, and I think he would uh, think that after the passing of Arafat, there's a new opportunity. I think the Palestinians are weary of the of the of the, this intifada. Uh, he would be uh, skeptical about uh, the ability of uh, Abu Mazen to deliver, but nevertheless he would uh, try and, and deal with him. Uri, one of the first things Amir Peretz did when he won the race for the labor primaries was to visit Rabin's grave. Is Peretz going to follow in Rabin's footsteps, or would Rabin have considered Peretz a bit too far left even for him? I think uh, on the socio-economic issues, definitely yes. I, I don't think Rabin was as socialist as as Paris is, and the peace, peace, uh, uh, pursuing peace. I'm sure they would be the same. R uh, Paris come from a different background. You know, he doesn't have the air of security. He wasn't uh, general, etc. So it would it would be more difficult for him because Israeli still value. Uh, and the military uh, people, but maybe that's the change of times, and it's it's about time that some uh, uh, other kind of, uh, of leaders step forward. Uri Dromi from the Israel Democracy Institute, thanks for coming in and sharing your knowledge of the Slavic Prime you. Minister. In Moscow, the Russian Democratic Liberal Party organized a protest to show solidarity with the Syrian people. Demonstrators took to the streets of Moscow, specifically around the vicinity of the Syrian embassy, to voice their support to Damascus. This comes amidst an increase of international pressure on Syria to cooperate with the investigative committee into the assassination probe of the former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafik al-Hariri. 
The Russian Democratic Liberal Party organized a massive rally near the Syrian embassy in Moscow to show solidarity with Damascus, which has been recently under a tremendous amount of international pressure with the possibility of economic sanctions in the aftermath of the Mehres report. The Russian Democratic Liberal Party's leader, Lamadir Rijonsky, denounced the calls for economic sanctions against Syria. The next step will focus on imposing economic sanctions against Syria, banning air traffic to and from Syria, freezing Syrian assets and banks' accounts, and finally toppling the Syrian regime. Mr. Rijonsky refuted the theory that Syria played a part in the assassination of al-Hariri. I do not believe that Syria is behind al-Hariri's assassination because it's not in its interests. The Hariri death probe has been politicized to justify this anti-Syrian campaign. In a press conference, Mr. Rijonsky made the connection between the Russians' demonstration and the riots in France and other Western European countries. This demonstration has something to do with what is happening in France. There is a malicious campaign out there to create division between France and other European countries and the Muslim world. Many native and immigrant Muslims live in Russia. We must exercise caution and stand united against sectarian animosity and religious hatred. According to observers, the rally expressed the positive opinion of many Russian people towards Syria. This demonstration comes to reinforce the good and long relationship between Moscow and Damascus. Rajanovsky's pro-Syrian statement and remarks express the Russian people's attitude and position towards Damascus. Officially, the Russians' position towards Syria is very obvious. It is a positive one. Russia's positive position on Syria has been reiterated repeatedly by the Russian President Putin and his country's foreign ministry. It is also evident in the United Nations. Russia takes credit for urging the UN to exclude articles that call on imposing economic sanctions against Syria. ويعتقد المحللون أن روسيا تركز الآن نشاطها الدبلوماسي على حث دمشق على التعاون مع ليش. Meanwhile, Russia is urging Syria to cooperate with the International Investigation Committee to spare Damascus and the entire region from facing yet another crisis. The Syrian problem will be one of the most primary topics discussed in the upcoming meeting between Putin and Bush during the Economic Coordination Summit that will take place in South Korea next week. Russia is facing a difficult task. It will try to spare Syria international economic sanctions while maintaining a good relationship with the U.S. administration. The Islamic Revolution Ayatollah Ali Khamenei says Islamic Republic of Iran is heading towards its objectives and vision in the country's 20-year outlook plan. Speaking to a gathering of Friday prayer leaders, Monday Ayatollah Khamenei also stressed what counts most under current circumstances is for the ruling to make efforts and help the nation remain united and vigilant, keep their revolutionary values alive through creating hope, determination and hard work. The leader, meanwhile, said President Ahmadinejad's government has been selected by the people and tends to render services to them. The leader concluded by calling on the Friday prayer leaders to assist President Ahmadinejad's government and not raise too much expectations, which may require a long time to materialize. Iran's visiting foreign minister, Manucher Motaki, and Syrian President Bashar al-Assad underlined Monday the need for Tehran and Damascus to further their mutual economic relations. At the meeting, as Motaki later told reporters, among issues discussed there were ways to boost mutual ties, Syria's cooperation with the United Nations over the killing of former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq al-Hariri, and the U.S. and its interventionist policies that benefit interests of the Zionist regime in the region. 
Motaki also said Iran and Syria enjoy a common stance over Iraq's future, which is to provide Iraqi nation with a chance to determine its own fate. Russia says there is no reason to politicize Iran's nuclear case at the International Atomic Energy Agency Board of Governors. Head of the Commission of the International Affairs at the Russian Duma, Konstantin Kasyachov, made the remark late Monday and ruled out the possibility of serious opposition against Iran's peaceful program at the upcoming IAEA board meeting. A senior official at Russia's Geopolitical Academy, Leonid Ivashov, too, supported Iran's nuclear activities geared for its civil purposes and said Moscow will take a stance to Tehran's benefit, which can't stand up to the U.S. politicized stance. The death of the international Syrian producer Mustafa Abad gave a new meaning to the tragedies caused by the Amman explosions. In news of the death of the messages of producer resulted from his injuries while in the hospital in Jordan's capital came as a shock to artistic and political circles, which were very saddened by the loss of one of the Arab cinema giants whose successes exceeded the border of the Arab world. The explosions in Amman have created a dramatic and a tragic situation that did not usually exist in other attacks. The unfolding bloody events associated with these attacks seem to be part of a well-done movie that would make people wonder whether it was fake or real, except for its catastrophic ending. Amidst the scenes of fear and destruction, people tell horrific testimonies and stories about the victims and destruction that hit them from nowhere. Mustafa Aqad, the Syrian filmmaker whose fame went beyond the horizon, was one of the dozens killed in a very dramatic way. The fate of the man who fought extremism with his cinematic creativity ended at the hands of extremists. He died of sustained wounds in his neck, which was hit by shrapnel. I face more opposition making the movie The Message from Muslims than I did from the West and Jews. Aqad was waiting for his daughter in one of the three hotels that were targeted by the explosions so they could go together to attend a wedding. But they fell as victims of violence. His daughter died instantly while he sustained major injuries in his neck, causing him to lose a lot of blood. He was then transported to the Shmisani Hospital in the capital Amman, where a medical team monitored his health conditions. Initial medical reports indicated that there was no reason to worry about the medical conditions of Aqad, who produced the movie Omar Mukhtar. However, it seemed that the news of his daughter's death caused him to have a heart attack, which killed him the next day. No Arab filmmaker has ever been able to achieve as much international recognition as Mustafa Aqad, nor did America's Hollywood movie industry ever accept an Arab filmmaker the way it accepted Mustafa Aqad. His pride in his Arab and national origins were evident in his movies, which were dedicated to save the plight of his nation, to which he never turned his back or stopped holding pride. His immortal movie, The Message, that tells the story of the messenger Muhammad, peace be upon him, is absolutely the most important movie ever shown on the silver screen about Islam. Aqad wanted this movie to reflect the true values and principles of Muslims, refuting the misconceptions implanted in Western media, both deliberately and ignorantly. He succeeded in his mission, but it seems that this cowardly attack has taken his dream of making yet another film continuing his mission. The news of his sudden death came as a shock, silencing people and suffocating them. The views expressed on Mosaic are not those of Link TV or its sponsors, but of the broadcasters themselves. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation, and Henry and Virgilia Dakin.